Welcome to our daily coverage of the Volvo Ocean Race. It is now the start of leg nine. Newport to Cardiff in Wales, and it's certainly been an incredibly foggy start. Team Brunel getting off to a strong start from the import section of the race, but a lot has changed since then. We're going to be hearing from the sailors, Pablo Ratti on board overall race leaders, Mafre, as well as Charlie Enright, co-skipper on Vestas Lemfethal Racing. Plus, Conrad Coleman is going to be here talking us through the weather and the strategy that's going to matter for the boats out on the water on leg nine as we have a look at exactly how these boats are going to win the double points on offer. But before we do that, let's take a look at how the race has unfolded so far. It is 3,000 miles from Newport to Cardiff, and it began with a very congested start through the exclusion zones and Dong Fong race team taking the lead as the boat sailed out into the open race course. But no surprise, Mafre close on their heels in second place with Team Brunel in third. Then a very tightly packed four boats. Vestas, 11th hour racing, pushing their way down with Sun Hung Kai Scallywag to the south has turned the tide on plastic with a first boat to jibe. A very crucial moment right now as the boats try to pick the exact shift to jibe on and Pablo Arati on board Mafre happy at the moment about the way things are going. Yeah, we have Nieti here on the grinder, Tamara on the main sheet and I'm Blair driving. So with the four of us, just uh, for one more hour, Blair and myself, and then Nieti and Tamara, they, stay, they will stay two more hours. Uh, and when Blair and myself, we come down, it will be uh, Willie and, and Rob coming on deck. Pablo, we can uh, <laughs> see you at the back just behind the helm, and it looks like to be a very happy boat. Yes, uh, we are very happy. We are back, uh, back racing and on the Atlantic and yeah so far we are doing quite nice and yeah we're happy and looking forward to keep going and keep pushing. Double points for this one, how's your confidence? It's gonna be a tricky leg, uh, it's gonna be quite a few fronts and then a transition so uh, we will have to make uh, big decisions and, and as, as the other boats as, as well no so for us I think uh, speed wise we are okay and it's just be concentrate and and try to, to be with the pack and don't get on the back foot uh, with a, a bad decision. So that's our goal this leg, no? Uh, still, still many points uh, to play and, and uh, yeah, this leg anything can happen. And obviously Dongfeng race team, they've got off to a great start this leg. You're going to need to hold on to them. Yes, exactly. They they seems like uh, they have a good speed and they did a great job uh, yesterday and last night. Uh, they are a few miles uh, to leeward of us, so they are ahead of us. Uh, so yes, I think uh, I think it's a still long way to go and and probably now with this uh, front passing uh, uh, we will uh, catch them again a little bit. So soon we will have to jump just to to get onto the northly wind and then we will get a header and uh, when to jipe is, is the key moment. No? Now we have a header, the wind is a little bit more left than we expect. Uh, but uh, yeah, the moment, on, the moment of the jipe will be a key moment and we're just waiting and paying attention on the, on the wind and the clouds just to see when is the right moment and, and hopefully we can cut some miles to Domfen. Pablo Arate on board, Mafre chasing down Dongfeng race team. Now that conversation was a few moments ago and what I can tell you is that Dongfeng race team since then has jibed. Now Mafre do not know this, the two boats separated too far to pick them up on AIS. So watch very closely on the live tracker to see how Mafre are gonna respond to what is going on on the racetrack. Do they know, do they have any inkling? Well on the other side of the racetrack, we've got Vestas 11th hour racing. Charlie Enright on board as the skipper, talking us through a very close battle with Sun Hunkai Scallywag. Yeah, those guys are just, I don't know, a half mile or something on our hip in the fog. We can barely see them. You know, the visibility's not great. Um, you know, what a day leaving Newport. It was pretty nice, the fog lifted and everyone got a good show. Nice flat water, a good breeze. Uh, you know, by the time we had a peel off getting around the TSSs, we kind of had Brunel and Dong Fong launched and us, Axo, Scallywag and Mapfrey all kind of overlapped with each other. But um, yeah, it's been, it's been difficult with the transitions. The breeze isn't mixing really well, um, you know, because of the stream and just because we're ahead of this front. So it's been a little twitchy. Uh, we've been on the back foot a little bit uh, with our speed at times, but uh, you know, 
us and Scallywag have seemed to be in the same patch of water and we're kind of going about the same. This front's kind of catching us up here. And, uh, you know, we had some flicks to a jiving number about an hour and a half ago. Um, you know, leaning on the south looks a little bit more user friendly and uh, we have a breeze direction now that's allowing us to get that way. You know, whether that's the uh, the moving water, the temperature differential, or just kind of oscillations out in front of, uh, you know, what's behind us remains to be seen. But I think we're pretty happy to get this way, especially on the numbers that we have currently. You know, we're going to we're going to jibe here once the thing rolls us over and then we'll have a pretty difficult transition through a little bubble high. And then, uh, you know, the next low pressure will form off the coast and we'll be uh, back on starboard and uh, blast reaching here in just a couple days time. Well, the blast reaching indeed. I mean, potentially some big breeze waiting for you guys out there on the ocean. Yeah, there could be some uh, some big breeze in the forecast the way that these lows intensify coming off the east coast of the U.S. Um, yeah, you can get some pretty pretty good pressure, uh, you know, spontaneously sometimes. And there's a big high pressure kind of blocking us from getting to the UK. So that pressure gradient should get pretty strong. And lastly, Charlie, before I let you get back to pushing the boat and sailing hard, double points for this leg, uh, pretty important for you. Uh, yeah, definitely. Could be a big mover in the standings. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're certainly pushing hard. It's an important leg for us and our team, you know, based on where we are. So... Um, you know, we're going to do the best we can with what we got. And uh, there's a lot of twists and turns, certainly, between here and the finish. So we'll stay on our toes. Well, as Charlie Enright says on board Vessels Lemeth Hour Racing, it's an important leg. So I've got Conrad Coleman here joining us in the studio to talk us through it. But before we do that, let's take a look at what's at stake, because we know it's a double points leg. But what are the scores at the moment? Well, if you are watching this, you can go to the Volvo Ocean Race website. And if you do, if you click on racing, this is what you get, the live tracker. And that's gonna be live all the way through to the finish line in The Hague. But on the right-hand side, you've got a bunch of options. Have a click on scoreboard. This will take you to the current scores. You've got the overall and the import. We're gonna stay with the overall at the moment. And Mafre, on top at the moment, three points ahead of Dongfong Race Team. That's not much, is it, going into a double points leg? It's not at all. And the, and the, the consequence of the extra bonus point for the boat that wins the leg plus the bonus point, uh, plus the double points, means that if Dongfong race team wins and Mafre comes even second, then it's tied at the top. Anything more than that means that Dongfong would take uh, the lead again. And so it could really go either way quite dramatically, even seeing Brunel come back and, and overtake the two red boats. Well, I know that Bauer Becking isn't ruling that out. That is what they're trying to do. But let's take a look now at, at something else we like to do at this point, at the start of the leg, the, the cruise. Again, on the right-hand side, on the website under racing, you've got crew list. If you click on that, you'll see a full list of who is sailing on the boats, their bios, even down to the onboard reporters who are there filming, photographing everything and reporting back to us. But to make it simple, have a click on show only ins and outs. What's dramatic for this leg is there really is very few crew changes. Team Axe and Abel, Dongfong Race Team, nothing. Mafre, they're bringing Sophie Sisik back on board after an injury, but Vesta Salimthar Racing, Team Sunhunkai Scallywag, no changes. Turn the tide on plastic, yes, but we'd expect that with a squad system. We know that that's been the way that they've been running things, but nothing again on Team Brunel. So, Conrad, the teams at this point, happy with what they're doing in terms of the numbers and the people that are on board pushing these boats pretty hard. So then... What is going to make a difference? You know, obviously not the sailors, as far, far as they're concerned. What are going to be the moments in this leg that we need to keep a, a close eye for? Well, there's lots of tricky weather. As, as you pointed out, and we're, we're looking at the tracker right now, Dongfong has just jived. The cold front is rolling over the, over the top of them right now. So lots to play for. Let me uh, sort of well, take you on a little bit of a tour uh, through the North Atlantic. Let's have a look. All right, well, that's pretty much where the boats are right now with the cold front rolling over them with this, this sort of imminent jive coming up. Uh, but it's going to be pretty light and fluky. You know, we've got not much wind over here um, over the next couple of days. So if we zoom forward to where we are now, uh, we can see that uh, we've got relatively light wind here, but then relatively strong and stable breeze. And I would expect the fleet to be around here uh, on, on Tuesday. So... It's going to be building conditions. Keep your eye over here on the right-hand side. This is a high-pressure zone, an anti-cyclone, and the, um, the boats are going to be sailing basically this week in the confluence of the wind coming out of that high-pressure zone and then what's also coming up over here, which is going to be a new depression. Uh, let's roll forward to Thursday. 
and, uh, and look at how that dynamic between the two systems plays out. Well, again, you can see that we've got this high pressure zone here that's been completely pancaked by this massive depression here with a strong frontal zone. Now, in terms of winds, that means that the boats are gonna be sailing in, in 25 to 35 knots of uh, wind from the south, and uh, around Thursday, I'm expecting them to be a little bit north of Rumline, up around there. They're gonna be loving life up there. It's gonna be flat seas, strong winds, on a reach, they're gonna be absolutely blazing. However, all good things come to an end. If we look towards the end of the week, uh, up towards the weekend, uh, and also the end of the strong conditions. Again, that, that high pressure zone has been pancaked into a ridge and that is gonna be stopping the boats. So it's, it's an opportunity for uh, the fleet to be coming in this way. The, the, the boats that didn't fare so well in that strong reaching condition will catch up. However, uh, the, the transition between the wind from this direction with that slight curve and then the wind from that direction is going to be absolutely crucial. So all to play for even after that strong sleigh ride in towards uh, the coast of Ireland. Afterwards, well, it's anybody, anybody's guess. The strong currents, uh, and there's lots of technical options, and it looks like it's going to be upwind on the way to Cardiff. Now, I know that there was a lot in there, so let's have a look at this in another way. Uh, I've got here a summary from the output of the routing software that we use here in the office and indeed on the boats. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that this chart here uh, has a blue line, which is wind speed, and it has another one, which is boat speed, that sort of mirrors it quite closely. Now, where the boats are right now is in this period here, relatively light winds after the passage of the uh, cold front. Round about Wednesday, Thursday, we're gonna see the stocks rising. Um, the, the wind is going to increase. They're going to be in a reach. So the, uh, you can see all these little icons up here that the, uh, that the wind is gonna be at the, uh, on the beam side of the boat. So blasting along in around 30, 35 knots, maybe gusting 40. So really, really fast conditions here. Followed by, boom, stock crash. Uh, when the boats are arriving on the uh, eastern side of the Atlantic on the approach to, um, to Ireland, we, we're gonna see this zone here. That's what I talked about with that little passage of the ridge. That's gonna be an absolutely crucial moment. So keep your eyes peeled on that. Followed by a uh, relatively upwind, relatively light wind um, route into Cardiff. Now, there's one more thing that is important on this leg, and that is the red box that I pointed out on the tracker when I was there earlier. Now, this sort of um, purple violet line that sits on the inside is created by the IIP, or the International Ice Patrol. That is a consortium uh, of, or activities put together by um, the US Coast Guard and the Canadian Coast Guard, and they actually overfly this zone from Newfoundland and actually count icebergs. So these little boxes here, the, the smaller ones with the numbers inside, those represent the number of, identi uh, of identified targets um, uh, literally counted out of the, out the window of an airplane, uh, also using radar and a whole bunch of other stuff. But if you remember, this was put together in 1915, just after the sinking of the Titanic, and since that time there have been no other fatalities as a result of an impact with ice. So clearly, the system's working really well. So you'd be wrong to think that this leg is just going to be a simple sprint into card if this is going to be anything but double points on offer, 3,000 miles and some very tough racing over some interesting transitions in the breeze. And at the press conference in Newport, the skippers were holding back nothing about their nerves as to what's at stake. I think it's always good to be in the lead and, and just shows that uh, things have been done uh, good. Of course, it's, it's tough and it's more and more difficult every leg because everyone is, uh, is much more even. And, and I think, uh, I don't know, we, we, of course, we didn't win the last leg as we wish, but uh, we take it anyway. And, and of course, you know, we analyze and I think, uh, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, thinking we're doing the things, we are not doing the things right to, to be able to win the next one. So, you know, we will start strong and, and push hard to win the next leg. Uh, we have no choice. We want to, to stay ahead. Bonelli is doing a fantastic comeback or so, and uh, I know Bo is a good finisher from the last race. So no, we have no choice. We have to beat them, but uh, of course it's difficult, and it's, it's not only about Mapri and Bonelli. As say, Xabi said, the fleet, the fleet is very even, and uh, everybody is doing a good job now and good speed, and it's much more complicated to be ahead. And, uh, 
So it's going to be a big challenge, but uh, we are ready for that. And uh, of course, we, we are going to fight. I think uh, <laughs> our objective is quite obvious. We have to beat the two red buses. If not, then uh, there's no chance for, for an overall win for us. So that's the first objective. And of course, it will be nice to be first in there, sixth and seventh, because then it will be really game on for the last two legs. I think uh, we made huge steps. I think everybody probably agrees. At the beginning, we weren't that good. I think from uh, Hong Kong, Going to Auckland was the first time actually that we started becoming happy as a team. We had a horrible result, but that's another thing. That's again uh, how sailing goes. But I think uh, just basically from Auckland uh, to here, uh, we sailed excellent. And uh, just one of the things as well, when you sail fast, you sail smarter as well, because everything that you do, you can probably, even when you make a mistake, you can still cover it up with speed. Everyone in the team is unbelievable hungry uh, to get uh, onto that podium. and. Uh, and I think uh, Brunel has the fear uh, that they can only lose it, right? So uh, <laughs> I'd rather be in my spot at the moment and uh, keep fighting hard and uh, give everything we can. That was the press conference in Newport before the start of leg nine. From there, pretty much the sailors took to the water to take the battle to the race course. It was a very intense start. If you haven't been able to watch it, here's a quick replay highlight. It's the final ocean leg to cross, it's double points for leg nine, transatlantic across the pond, it is all go to the UK and Cardiff, Wales, a clear start. Scallywag in the middle, best of 11th hour racing at the committee boat, an excellent start from Matt Frey, but look at this, Don Fong underneath everyone, taking their sterns, they like the right hand side, what a seed, what a perfect start from all seven boats. How exciting. Plenty of action. My goodness, do these people not know they have thousands of miles to go. Brunel on the right. Sun Hun Kai Scallywag in the middle, not so good. Matt Frey doing great work, looking like they're crossing over the whole fleet. That left-hand side was very good. Here we go, Matt Frey leading around the first windward mark. Oh, very tight between Axo Nobel and Festus. Axo Nobel just squeezed in, turned the tide on plastic, coming in on port. So they have to avoid everybody else. And look how slow Festus 11th hour racing are going. They're getting rolled over by T. Brunel. This could be interesting. D. Kafari got to use all her skills right here. Oh, is she going to get ahead of Festus 11th hour racing? Close, close. D. Kafari's going to go for it. She's going to attack there. Oh, my word. Is that legal? Is that OK? What are the umpires going to say? And that's the red flag from the umpire boats. We're watching a match race battle right now at the beginning of this three and a half thousand mile leg. Matt Frey are being ground down by Dong Fong race team. Dong Fong jived away and Matt Frey have jived to stick with them. These two like glue, only a few boat lengths in between them. These red boats can't get away from each other. These two red boats, if they play with each other too much longer, that yellow thing is gonna be right by both of them. Yes, starboard on Matt Frey. Brunel have to avoid a big head up on the bow. Pete Burling got it all under control though. Brilliant sailing from Team Brunel, who take the lead ahead of Matt Frey and Dong Fong race team in second and third around the Gurney's Resort Mark. My guess is we're going to see some pretty good pace uh, once these guys get offshore and they can crack sheets. Oh my word, look at that spectator fleet, unreal. Newport deserved to throw a showing like this to get these amazing sailors and amazing boats out of here, an event that we all love so much. Amazing stopover for the Volvo Ocean Race. A great start to leg nine. We're going to be here every day to bring you the updates from the racetrack. And also we're going to be launching a competition. We've got a rather fun prize to give away a cardboard cutout of one of the skippers signed by them in Newport. We will let you know how you can win it and what the skipper, who the skipper is tomorrow. But the eagle eyed of you and our viewers might be able to guess already. Also tomorrow we're going to be speaking to Dong Fong race team at the moment. The leg leaders, will they still be in the morning? We've got our quick fix coming up for you first thing, then at 1300 UTC, another daily show. And today, we're going to leave you with some words from the teams about leg nine, this iconic transatlantic race. Leg nine's a complicated one. Uh, double points from Newport, Rhode Island to Cardiff in the UK. And it's about 3,000 miles. I'm sure it'll be just as close as the rest. And that will be a double point leg again within the Volvo Ocean Race. It's double points, but it's pretty short and intense. It's 3,000 miles, and you could ride a big weather system, and it could be 
feeling like a southern ocean lake. It can be as cold, as dangerous, as windy as the southern ocean. You know, everyone always speaks about the southern ocean and, and I understand that because it's far away from land and everything, but maybe I'm a bit subjective as a North European, but <laughs> I think uh, the, 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 the North Atlantic is by far uh, probably the most dangerous sea to cross. It's going to be a fast one and what makes it dangerous is we are not in the south, so we are, if there is 40 knots of wind, we are going to push as much as we can. We are not going to feel the same and say, okay, let's wait, let's preserve the boat before we pass Cape Horn. No. Well, the Atlantic can bite, and uh, I think I have to go back uh, to 2006. Uh, maybe everybody remembers uh, the movie star story. Uh, yeah, the boat, uh, the boat sunk on that leg, so it's just one of these things. It can happen, and what I said, if the conditions are, are bad, uh, bad things can happen. And the actual finish is the approaches are full of traffic separation schemes. The UK coastal area is pretty tough. It's got rocks, it's got fishing boats, it's got commercial traffic. The Bristol Channel itself has like eight knots of tide. It's got a lot of shallows in it, a lot of fast running water, and the finish is going to be a really restricted area of where we can actually sail. Everybody has to push much more than we, we have done, and everybody is going to do it because no choice.